30 months ago, I gave a TED Talk in uh, Christ Church, New Zealand. And something really extraordinary has happened to me. First of all, my neighbor in Sacramento waves at me. I had to go to New Zealand for my neighbor to wave at me. <coughs> but then uh, my TED Talk uh, was about my experience in Africa as a young man. And I told this uh, silly story about our, you know, uh, misguided international aid project. And I told the story about us Italian going to teach the Zambians how to grow Italian tomatoes. And uh, we were very successful. The tomatoes grew beautifully. And when the tomatoes were nice and ripe and red, the hippos came out of the river and they ate everything. <laughs> uh -huh, slightly embarrassing, but what happened is that because I admitted uh, my stupidity in Africa, for the last 30 months, this tech talk has 70,000 hits per month for 30 months, millions of people. So, so what happened is that all these people started to come out of the closet to tell what they done in Africa, in you know, Latin America, in international development. And the stories are unbelievable, you know, what they've done with Aboriginal people, with Eskimos. And, and I need to tell you this story because it's fantastic. This guy from the American Peace Corps said to me, Ernesto, let me tell you what we did in Guatemala. I said, okay, tell me, tell me. <laughs> he said, we arrive in this village, and these guys have this fantastic agriculture, but they cannot sell to the neighbor because they have a very rough river there. So we arrived there, and we said, we're going to build you a bridge. And the people said, you cannot build a, a bridge here. And the guy said, hey, we are Americans. We are the Peace Corps. <laughs> we're going to build you a bridge. So the local people said, OK. Show us. And the guy said, Ernesto was a nightmare because on the other side of the river, there was a jungle. And we had to get these heavy dozers to come all the way on the other side. We had to build our own road there. And then we had to build this massive ramp, you know, to, to make one ramp on one side, this embankment, another one on the other side to span the bridge. So, you know, we spent months building this massive, massive embankment. And when we finished, the rainy season came, and the river moved its banks one mile. So now we had the ramp over nothing. And the guy is saying, he said, that's bad, but what I'm thinking, Ernesto, is that in 4,000 years, there will be an American anthropologist going through the jungle of Guatemala. <laughs> They will come to the ramp and will say, I wonder what the native people did with this. <laughs> and then they will say, oh, wait a moment. It's pointing to Orion. So this is an astronomical device. It's a, you know. So now I'm convinced that Stonehenge is an international aid project. <laughs> Not quite finished. So. That was the first thing that happened. First, the first thing, my neighbor waves on me. That's good. Number two, all these people from all over the world are opening up and confessing to me what they've done wrong in international aid. The title of my talk was Shut Up and Listen. And for the last 30 years, I've done that. I've set up an entire different system where we only go when invited, we never arrive with our own ideas. We simply shut up, find out what the local people want to do, and then we help them transform the talent, the passion, the beauty into a way of feeding the families, feeding the villages, and transforming the world. So I started to receive lots and lots and lots of emails, calls, from this obscure race of individuals called the millennials. <laughs> I'm 65. When I was born, there was not even a television set 
in my town. And these people are mysterious to me. <laughs> so I started to talk to them and started to listen to them. And what I've discovered is something that moves me. These guys are magnificent. The millennials, I call them the splendid generation. Wow. My generation, we believe that greed is good. The millennials believe that the only business to be in is a good business. They are magnificent. And we need them. We need them desperately. We need them. The title of this talk is The New Victorians, The Millennial Revolution. Why I call this the New Victorians is because the Victorians invented everything. 100-year period, everything we use now was invented by a generation that transformed the world. They invented steel, cars, locomotives, radio, x-ray, philanthropy. They invented uh, public education. They invented everything. They took humanity out of the Middle Ages. They took humanity out of the horror of the Inquisition, the horror of the 18th century, and they gave us all the technologies, all the mechanical technology that we use now are Victorian, everything. But those technologies are not enough. You see, we do not have the technologies to feed, clothe, educate, cure, transport, network 7 billion people. The technology that Victorians gave us cannot do this for seven billion people. Fossil fuel cannot provide the energy for seven billion people. We are now at war. We are at war. The technology that we have is good for maybe two billion people in the world, but there are billions of people of one dollar a day even now, if the Chinese and the Indians will have the same numbers of cars per head of population of us Californians, we will be 50 million barrel of oil short every day. We need to reinvent everything. Who's going to invent the sustainable technologies to take us forward to the next 200 years? It's the millennials. It's you guys. It's you. And I have seen and I've already been at, uh, contacted by millennials who are doing exquisite work, but not only. I thought that the millennials were nerds and, you know, they live in strange places, in <laughs> lofts with sharing with three, four people or of indetermined sex, very difficult to understand. <laughs> Somebody will have to one day write a book about the mating rituals of millennials, because it's a <laughs> totally incomprehensible to me. <laughs> Any case. But I thought that they were just these nerds in pockets, you know, around you know, hubs in important cities. And then I started to see the people, the millennials all over the world, 16 years old, discovering how to make bread by hand, and the best bread I have ever uh, ate. South Africa, 16 years old, who learned from an 82-year-old baker. He went, he chased him, he said, please teach me. The old guy could not believe, because his children did not want to learn from him. And now this new generation, they're learning how to make bread and how to grow food and how to make, you know, look at the meat, meat packing district in New York. They're making sausages by hand and cheese, handmade cheese in New York. 
Look at San Francisco. Look at what's happening. These guys are not only nerds. They love quality. Love it. We thought that all those arts were lost, that nobody would make shoes by hand any longer. What? Now you have the millennials making shoes. I have a group, these millennials in Eritrea, they're making shoes designed by a, 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 uh, an English millennial with a, a, a New Yorker. They make them in Africa and they sell them to Tokyo and Hong Kong. Why are these millennials so good? Well, we have given them 30 years of environmental, civic, racial, gender, sexual uh, education. They're better than us. Absolutely. And I'm really mortified to see parents who don't understand them. They have these people in their house, these strange people. They want to do good. And how do you do good and do well? We are very ill-equipped to teach our kids how to do good and well, because none of us has done it. We go and work for any corporation, and now we discover that corporations which are not good corporations and not good citizens, they cannot attract and retain millennials. Millennials refuse to work for them. So. This happened to me, but then what happened to me was also that we have lots and lots of millennials calling from universities all over the world, from Stellenbosch in South Africa, Turkey, from Sweden, from Australia, say, Ernesto, please come and please teach us, because what they are teaching us is the same rubbish that created the global financial crisis. Please come. And I go there, never invited by the professors, always by the students, sometimes by the entire student body. And I go and speak to them about this idea that you know, not only you have, when you start a business, you have to uh, work with the passion of the proponent, but that inside the business, there are three different passions. There is a passion to make it, a passion to sell it, and a passion for financial management. And every successful company in the world, from Ford to Edison to uh, Microsoft to Apple, had different personalities at work. There was never one person doing all the work. It was two, three, or four friends who complemented the personalities. So what I have been doing for 30 years, which has been shut up, listen to people, helping them in 300 communities worldwide, I thought, well, 300 communities at the end of my life is you know, is not much. But then this TED talk has opened the doors to all these people coming to talk to me to say, teach us. And so what I think is that instead of an old cranky, you know, old man that not even his neighbor waved at, all of a sudden I am the spokesperson for a movement with no name. But the movement is happening. And the movement is a millennial revolution. And what I really suggest that we do as parents is that we help the millennials. All the money is in the center. All the innovation hap happens at the edge. How are we going to stop American corporations from hoarding money? What do we have to do to create such phenomenal proposals that when we go and look for venture, we are going not to do you know, a beauty context in the hope that somebody will give us a bit of money, but how do we work with this millennial to form formidable teams that can make it, sell it, look after the money so convincingly that we can unlock some of these um, massive amount of resources which are at the center we, which are with the old establishment. Two trillion dollars are now in the coffers of American corporations. How are we going to, you know, uh, create a partnership where the old generation helps you change and beautify the world? This is my hope. We are not finished as a race. We, we are not finished. We are at the beginning of our journey. 
you know, we are heading for the stars. All the new information technology, all the new tools are also helping us to grow our mind. We are not finishing as a race, we are just beginning. And what I would like to finish this talk is with one beautiful, beautiful quote from Teilhard de Chardin, who was a uh, Catholic priest, but he was also, also an anthropologist. And what Teilhard de Chardin was that he had finally discovered the missing link between apes and man. It is us. Thank you very much. Thank you.